discussion is about so we're looking on, by, from life things from keyhole as, as I say of mathematics and so so mainly I will speak about biology but in a very primitive way there are biologists here I, I apologize I will be explaining very simple things not, not, they may be not that simple but if you don't know them you better to know them including some terminology but basically I will eventually focus on some aspect of molecular biology and uh, and my point is not doing mathematical biology, not focusing on mathematical aspect of biology, but looking at actual bi biology phenomena, but from certain perspective, mathematical perspective. And there are instances of that in history, so I start with some examples to give an idea what it will be. But it will be but history certainly a long time ago when we can cite something, say, say, have some perspective, but that kind of perspective I want to apply to the what's happening today or tomorrow. And so here is, it's, the first is Fibonacci, and this of course is mathematician, and this is certainly a picture very attractive to mathematician. You see the it's small letters, I think it is, you see 34, or something you can know what the preceding Fibonacci numbers, and this is a kind of one of the most striking instances of highly non-trivial mathematics, you know, perfect. The golden ratio appearing in biology systematically under the name of phylotaxis, and it comes, it's motivated by Fibonacci observation, who counted rabbits, generation of rabbits. And it was how many? 800 about years ago. And then it took a long time, and then in about 800 years, Darwin generalized this to elephants and became so famous, right? So what, it's kind of a bit bizarre, in my view, that it took so long time and mathematicians were not participating. So, of course, I'm kind of, it's kind of a joke, but then you see this quotation, and so the point of, the point of Fibonacci was a kind of particularly nice formula, and Darwin also computing how many elephants will be in, in say, in 60 or, uh, 600 years or something like that, taken into account and some of them die. I think Fibonacci wouldn't make that correction. And Darwin made an error. But for some reason, he made, instead of making it smaller, he made, he made it about 1,000 bigger. So he got millions where there should have been thousands. And then there was a very funny explanation that the articles, when people make this computation correctly, very proud of themselves and full generality, and saying that probably with Darwin poor, he didn't have computer. So he made this mistake by order of two, two or three orders of magnitude. It's kind of funny things happening there when, when speak, people speak about Darwin. He's kind of a saint, and so everything becomes kind of rather bizarre what was said about him. And this quotation is not by Darwin, by the way. And when Darwin described this kind of quotation, it always looked very silly because he was a really great man. It's not that it was a big discovery to say that elephants reproduce almost as fast as rabbits on the large scale, on logarithmic scale. And this actually is, was said by somebody else. So here is a reference who said it. You don't know who said it, of course. And it was said in a quite reasonable context. And it was said by Benjamin Franklin. And his point was that he was speaking about people. And he has observed that population in America grew up exponentially fast. And by the time Franklin was almost probably probably already more than people in England, though it was only eight, eighty hundred, eighty thousand people who came to, to 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 America, and then they overgrow uh, that, and then was apparently Malthus also taken over and repeated that, and, and then when there is enough space, people reproduce as fast as rabbits. When there is no space, you know what happens, like you now happens in Gaethje. There is no space people start killing each other, uh, very much as some animals do, and no rabbits kill each other. And you know in Australia, they didn't, rabbits haven't come to this point as to, pe to start kind of kill each other. And, and Darwin said something else, yeah. but essentially the same. And then this was what hardly it was a serious point for, 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 for Darwin. It was a different point. And so, so I shall say a few words ago. But I want to say that evolution theory, what Darwin made there, 
nine, in my view, at least 99 percent of mathematics. It's just understanding really behavior of certain functions. But biological input was every kind of child knows about animals, and he just made certain conclusion out of that, make some conjecture, and he made a conjecture which is still not fully justified about how, how evolution functions, what is sufficient for the evolution as we observe it, and of course he knew much less than we know today. And, uh, and this contrary to what sometimes people say, that he discovered some selection, he explained evolution, which is absolutely wrong, he never claimed this Darwin himself. Yeah, if you really look at Darwin, have no objection to what he says. He's just a really great man, something explaining. And then it was repeated in a very trivialized way by people, and just many, there's a tremendous gap again in my view if what said by, and what's done by people in molecular biology and people in evolution theory. And there is this gap of level, in my view, intellectual level. And people, evolutionists usually very naive. Yeah? You can argue with them without knowing anything, yeah? because it's mathematics. The fact that exponential function may be a factor, major factor of evolution. Which, but it's not a factor, it's just language from mathematical point of view. It's a language like differential equations. They don't explain physics of a certain kind. It just gives you language to describe this physics. The same, of course, natural selection. It's a language describing certain phenomena extremely. It, Darwin realized that apparently, in, intuitively, because he was actually a mathematician, I think, in heart, but not a mathematician of 19th century when computation was crucial, couldn't compute. He always made mistakes in computations. But his vision was, however, right. And he was not a biologist. I would say almost everything he said biologically happened to be wrong. But it was not the point. He was a kind of great mind. He had the overall picture in details that kind of was not essential. So I'm not critical of Darwin. I think he was great, but I don't think he's a saint, either of science or of mathematics. But he's more mathematician than a scientist. Because he understood actually what well, okay, we, we come to that later. I don't want to. And then the next, after Fibonacci, was who made some point on biology was Galileo, and again he was not a biologist, but he pointed out that you cannot s scale animals linearly all proportional, because they, they wouldn't stand because you say length of a bone and its thickness cannot go linearly in you know, order to, to have stability. And then the more general principle is uh, more common and, and more kind of useful in biology is proportionality of the weight or scaling constant or scaling co coefficient or, or Kleber law that, that um, your know, metabolic rate of an organism grows proportionally to three over fourth power of the mass. And and then there is a whole discussion, sometimes true, sometimes not, and there is lots of mathematics about that. If you think, for example, what would be the scaling rate of growth, depending on the mass of an animal, or the length of all uh, of the total blood system? There are lots of, lots of, it's very long, it goes probably in kilometers, and how it grows. And this particular exponent, and this exponent can be divined by pure mathematical thinking. Right? It's a tree and growth and the limit, limitation of this tree, and that's kind of a mathematical problem. And there are papers usually done by physicists who, done, who do this kind of mathematics. But this is mathematics. And started from Galileo, it's called allotropic mentioning. And then there was another in, in the row. It was Maperti. And Maperti, as you know, was a mathematician who suggested the minimal principle that orbits of a mechanical system minimize certain action. And as a mathematician, he also looked at biology as a mathematician, made quite a few point, pointed remarks. Apparently, he was the first who emphasized the unique origin. This is said about him, but I couldn't find it in his writing. I looked briefly at his writings a long time ago, and so this I couldn't find, but he, he made some other interesting points. And in particular, he made some foundation of genetics. His genetic was not quite correct, not the same as Mendelian, but it was a genetic, again, by 100 years ahead of his time, and nobody ever cited him in biology. And of course, interestingly enough, so again, about history of, history of science, this is an amazing thing. I found out that people who write about history of science have some, don't care to look at the internet. You, don't, you, you can find many things on the internet by now. Before it was not possible. For example, when there is an article about Maperti, he at some moment makes some quotation of some Greek author concerning 
uh, struggle for existence or something. And then this exactly, this exactly the same quotation is made by Darwin in his, in his book. And the author who wrote this historical essay, quite interesting, said apparently Darwin never read Mepertie, but it's not true. Darwin read Mepertie and referred to Mepertie at some point, but at, at a different point. And so probably, so Darwin was not very good, I think, at referring to other people because he was very much influenced by Lamarck and by, by Buffon. If you read them, you see how much they say in common, but he hated accepting that, yeah. Which is, we all suffer the same problem. But this is And so I, I, everywhere, uh, when I put it on the net, you see I have give references, you can read more about them. And then was Buffon. And Buffon was a, Kind of, the whole culture of science was shaped by Buffon for 100 years ahead of him, right? Darwin was pro fully, when anybody was brought by his he, he, natural history. You know, he wrote 30 something, 36 volumes of his natural history, and uh, in particular, he articulated precisely the uniqueness of origin. But again, he is criticized. Although he said it, he said, however, it doesn't correspond to certain scriptures, so I wouldn't, wouldn't believe into that. And people criticize him if he was not true Darwinism. He doesn't believe into Darwinism. I mean, not joking. Yeah. I mean, there is something wrong with mentality of people working Darwin. They can't say, oh, it doesn't contradict Darwin. Oh, I mean, that's absurd. And uh, this is extremely annoying and sometimes leads to negative results. And some people start to criticize Darwin, though he's not responsible for that. But, but, but the unique origin certainly was first, at least I saw in the, uh, in the written form only in Buffon. And by the way, if you read French, it's fantastic reading. His, 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 his run, read, written by perfect French, which I understand. I don't understand newspapers now, but I can understand Buffon. He's really good language. In my view, this is how language should be. Everything clear, no kind of terms, maximally explaining the idea, not, not hiding behind because it's stupid words. He's really kind of a fantastic. You know, he emphasized that you have to be a good writer. On the other hand, um, if you look at the Mepertie, it's very hard to understand what he says. And so there are some people say he actually invented the whole evolution theory, almost all genetics. He definitely had ideas, but what he truly understand, understood, truly understood what he had to say, because he writes in a very vague way, very approximate. He obviously, or the same is with, with this principle of Mepertie. He never justified it fully. It was done by Lagrange uh, about 50 years or more than that after that. But Buffon, he done many other things. He invented, by the way, what is now called the foundation probability theory accepted by Kolmogorov. It's a basic contribution by, by, by him. And he done many other things. He was absolutely fantastic person. And his, reading him is a pleasure. It's certainly a lot. But now you can find many of this on the internet, which are very convenient. And actually, um, the other thing I'm going to say, if you don't find something on the, on the internet, some of the articles you have to pay to, to go to the particular instances to, to make some work, of course, they don't exist. So if you publish in some mathematics something like Duke, don't do it. Nobody read it because it's not in the open access, right? So, so now science must be in the open access. Otherwise, it's, nobody goes to the extra pains to, to, to find it. And then there was Euler. And this is Euler Lotka equation. And this is uh, first with Euler and then 100 years, 200 years later, Lotka who more known for lotka Volterra equation. And this was just looking how people live, how they die, what is, and just, and this is not, not a trivial equation, and Euler done them. And then Lotka came, and, and the independent of Volterra, they found the equation, not found, he just, it, it, nowadays is kind of, after some modeling were done by people like Max, Maxwell and Boltzmann and this, now you don't think about that. You just, sort of, any kind of students can, write this equation and a variation of this equation. So this is life, how, 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 how long people live, what percentage of them die, what happens in some time. It's kind of trivial, all this activity. But apparently it was not trivial even 100 years ago. It was not automatic to write such a model and reduce it to a simple computation. i say a few words in a second about it. But, but this equation is quite a, somewhat amusing. In a second I return to this form because we go step ahead and there is a, this equation it, it's an uh, equation by Carter, Goldberg, Goldberg and Waage it's a mass action equation this is a fundamental equation in chemical kinetics and again it's completely obvious you have molecules and the rate of reaction depends on how often they hit each other and so we can write this formula and it's kind of obvious but this was not at all obvious at that time and it was also not read by people for a long time. Then it was discovered by Van Hoff, who was 
Moch got well positioned about 15 years later, but he accepted when he realized it was not a new. But this is in biology used all the time, or rather some refined version of this equation. This one of the basic kind of mathematical equation in chemistry and mathematics, and mathematically extremely interesting equation, which is mathematicians don't know usually, and they are not aware that 90% of papers in, in differential equation are written by chemists who understand many things by, by much better than we do. Because they work with this equation all the time, they actually have to run chemical reaction and develop mathematical means, I think, of a level of sophistication, which I know somewhat above what, or well, comparable to what mathematicians do. But, but, but mathematicians don't know that. And, uh, and this is these two guys. And this is actually amazing with this equation, what happens. It's, if you look carefully how reaction run, especially in, in biology, they never, if you have H2 and O, and they don't have H2O. It's not like that. You don't get water in one step. You have very many intermediates. And each of them, you may have this equation. They shouldn't give you such a good result in the, in the end, but they do. And we don't understand why. And so this, by the way, is a remark. And we still don't understand what happened there. And of course, on some level, this is called quantum mechanical stuff, or how broken bonds appear and disappear. And I don't think on this level it's understood at all. Why this equation can follow, say, from Schrodinger equation. It is a big mystery. At least I don't know that. I haven't looked in the literature, but my impression is not known. And then came Cain Daniel Bernoulli, who I, I don't confuse who Bernoulli. Not, it's not the one, of course, who, who found the law of large numbers, but he also was a statistician, and he developed a statistical model for epidemiology. He's still more or less used today, and he was checking if inoculation against smallpox actually uh, adds to longevity of people. And he made this around this equation, quite non trivial analysis, and decided it was good, yeah, to make an equation. It was, had positive effect. And if you look again, there are lots of mathematics attached to that. There are books full of formulas. And this now we kind of, again, it's unclear to me how to take this kind of mathematics. A priori, it looks kind of, oh, quite simple. In a way, I mean, simple in a way that you know what mathematics is. You just write, write this equation, and there is a big chunk of mathematics devoted to them. However, unless you run through this, you don't know if you get some interesting result. A priori, most of them don't give you very little in, in, in biology, not too much, but except for this kind of simple conclusion, like in, in Bernoulli. But in general, in, in a second, I mention some examples. Because again, all these people, which I'm mentioning here, you see, they're not biologists, but they'll see, look at biology mathematically. And of course, these two chemists, one of them was actually a chemist and another was a mathematician. Then they haven't thought about, about biology at all. And then come paper by Darwin and Wallace, and his joint paper, and this kind of amusing history, then Darwin wrote a volume after many kind of versions of his origin book, which is a, actually I find, heavy, unlike Buffon, much harder to read, yeah. Buffon writes kind of just for, for, for pleasure of reading, and, uh, and uh, writing by Darwin, heavy. And, uh, but, but, but then, you know, come the famous tree, Darwin tree, but this tree, by the way, what is tree, this tree? What do you know? What kind of tree is this? And this is exactly the point, that this is perfectly where Darwinian theory applies, but it's not a tree. It's not evolution tree, it's just a dry river. And, and evolution is no more than that. Mathematically, it's absolutely the same. So it has nothing to do with biology. You take a minimal input from biology. Of course, today is another story. We come to what happens today. But biology in time of Newton is the overall scheme of this. Of course, Darwin was looking at something else. I will tell you what his major conjecture was, in my view, I, I say it later. There was one conjecture. There were a lot of kind of trivial stuff. I mean, everybody understood the thing before him. But he emphasized to make some claim, conjecture, a claim, not, well, not a discovery, but a conjecture, which is, in some fundamental points, we know is wrong. We don't know how it's true and how wrong it is. It was two conjectures together. And then was Mendel. And this, I think, was a really kind of one of the greatest ideas in the in history of science. Yes, very, I don't know what it can be compared with, yeah. Because here, the picture, you have two, a group of animals, or head years with plants, completely similar in some respect. Here, the seeds are the same color. But then you interbreed them, and you have proportion three to one. 
and that R. And then this R, he created, pointed toward genetic, modern genetic and molecular biology. And this idea that there is kind of molecular interpretation of genetics was already in Maupertuis. He, he looked at, he was, he, his, he looked at the statistic of people having six fingers, yeah, in different families, and his conclusion were not exactly Mendelian. I looked briefly, so I wouldn't claim exactly what he done, but it doesn't quite correspond to what Mendel observed. And this is the idea of Mendel, that there are pairs of particles from father and from mother in each plant, and their proportion, if there is one of them dominant and recessive gene, and if it's dominant, it's one of them present, if there is a red and white parent, then it will be red. If two white, it's white, and if red and red, again red. So they have proportion one to three. And here is one interesting mathematical point. First, then, it's very simple. He, he was actually mathematically minded man. He has education as a physicist. He was, uh, he was a student, I forgot, but some mathematician in, in Vienna, in physicist. And, um, and so, he, and, and, but then he made very painful experiments. It was really not like Darwin. It was not philosophy, observation. It was active science. He made experiments, interpreted them, depending on what was happening, changing his experiment. And so it was absolutely a different level, in my view, intellectual level. And, or, or, and this is not so much kind of, I don't know, excite biology. For mathematicians, they, but, but Darwin is kind of obvious. Yeah. You can explain it to, to five years old. But with ben Mendel, it's not so obvious. It's still, to make this computation, and there is some conclusion from that, which was not accepted for biologists and bothered them for a long time, well, for several years, decades maybe, because mentally was not read, ignored. Actually, Darwin was making experiments similar to them, but he couldn't interpret them. He just went nowhere. He made quite intelligent, well, statistically well justified. By the way, poor Mendel, you know, he had to do it in his spare time. And then all his documents were burned, but his successor in this monastery, whatever it was. So we don't know what he actually, he may have, may have much more ideas. And this certainly indicates he was really, well, in my view, by order, magnitude above anybody else in biology at that time, including Darwin. And, uh, but then it is an interesting point here, which I want to I I I tell you. Yeah, by the way, about Darwin, yeah, there is some little mistake he was making, you know, some Jenkins pointed out some mistake, and so, and there is a very serious mistake because, he, and because it was before genetics, and discreteness of inheritance was not understood, and the continuous model, of course, nothing could work. It's kind of, well, I, I say, at some moment we'll say more about that, but, so this Hardy and Weinberg thing, and this is the following. This is some piece of mathematics. So this is what you do. You, or, or you have a mixture of, of two kinds of plants. You make the first, the first round of <coughs> in, in interbreeding them, and you have some distribution of features. And then you do it the second time. Then from point of view of the Ravenism, if some feature become more pronounced, you think, aha, this fetus survived, and so the next time it will be even more. No, it's stabilized in the first step. At, at least with some particular features. And this is certainly bothers Bowles a lot. In particular, Wallace was absolutely incensed and saying he just is Mandel is bullshit. And then Hardy, uh, mathematician Hardy wrote some paper in seven, no, half a page, and somebody, some physician, Weinberg wrote, I think, 50 pages or something, article, and they explained this mathematics. But what, in a second, I say about it is, but amazingly, and, 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 and Hardy says, well, this was a matter of multiplication type table. But he, he said he didn't understand it. Because Hardy, for all respect to him, was a multiplication type mathematician. He was thinking in terms of numbers, he made computation, up plus better, not say it, and that's it. However, this is quite a general phenomenon. And for those who know it's the same phenomenon, for example, around what's called super manifolds and super symmetry. If he understood it, he would go, he would develop some interesting theory like supersymmetry. But he didn't. He, he never tried to understand what happens. And what happens is the following phenomenon, and I think it's quite amusing, and it's not written in textbooks in genetics, I never found it, because people, these people are not mathematicians, and it is as follows. You have a, a matrix, and here there are some entries. And so if you take some element, you take some here, you time some here and multiply them. 
And then imagine the sum of the entries was one. There were probabilities, but they don't have to be positive, just to normalize. And then you divide by this sum again. So to have again total sum now one. So you, in each entry, you take this row, this row, multiply, add together. You have transformation in the space of matrices. This Mendelian transformation is matrices to matrices. And then fact this is this square of this equal M, I'm sorry. And this looks impossible, right? You have polynomial. You take iterate polynomial twice, degree must grow. How they can be the same? Well, this is not quite polynomial, it's rational function. But, but something like that happens to polynomial. And if you look at that, you see in mathematics it happens. It happens partial differential equations. And it happens in supersymmetry, and it happens in the important group, and it's a fundamental mathematical phenomenon. Something cancels off. But this is obvious. But when, if it's said this way, you don't have to make any computation. You just interpret this as a something, essentially associativity of tensor product or something like that. Yeah. It means that, if I'm not mistaken, some, oh yeah, I, I maybe A plus B. I, 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 I may be cheating or something like that. It doesn't matter how you put the, 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 the brackets. It's something of this nature. It's some formal property of tensor products. And this that, that, overlooked. It, but then mathematics goes next step. If, this is, if you look at a more, step actually was done by Bernstein, that you look at a more general situation, this kind of deployed organism, father and mother completely identical, and by the genetic message, which is not true, by the way, for human, as we know. We have, you know, that men and women contribute slightly differently to the genome of, of their children. And, uh, and um, then there are the so-called Bernstein algebras, class of non-associative algebras, quite amusing arriving there, not fully understood. And special class of them is so-called Jordan algebras used by physicists. So, so behind that, there is lots of mathematics and hardly fully have looked at. Another interesting point is, that if you look at the number of quotation on, on Google of a reference to Hardy Weinberg, it will be far more than anything to Hardy himself or Hardy Littlewood. It will be. And, and Hardy was very disrespectful of applied mathematics. And, uh, and he would be kind of somewhat shocked that this observation is really one line. But the point, of course, was not so much like his computation a plus b equals c, just simple identity. Which you, you can, you can write. He, he was doing this in the case of, of, of Hardy. It was for matrices two by two. And uh, with, I think with, with symmetric matrices, yeah. Two by two symmetric matrices. Or something like that. Where, of course, become some very simple identity. When you take square of, of, of this matrix. So, and uh, so what comes next? Yeah, and then, yeah, yeah, you want to say that then this Mendelian stuff and was combined with, with Darwinian, and this is Darwinian computation, we are, we are taking into account this kind of Mendel law, and, the, and then the, the, the develops kind of laws of mathematician, or, or biologists maybe mathematical reminded some mathematicians started doing that, and the most, after Hardy and Weinberg, it was three kind of very, very bright people, right? Haldane and, and Fisher, and Fisher maybe you know. Ronald Fisher was a statistician, mathematician, who actually made some, regardless of that, he made several remarkable contributions, and one of them, again, I want to say, which was motivated by biology, and was more known by, to, to biologists rather than to mathematicians. And this is the following. This is about entropy. It gives you explanation why entropy, this sum, log pi, and the sum of pi is one, of course, yeah. What's so special about this formula? Of course, some people say the definition of entropy. We just often say, they this, of course, we don't, don't know what entropy is, yeah. It was computational formula, which, which was written, by the way, not by Boltzmann, but by Planck, interpreting some work by Boltzmann. Oh, the, the formula was not, but it's this computational formula for entropy, entropy defined not, not like that. This is, it's another story. But once you accept it, looking at that, what's so special about that? And then you can say, aha, uh -huh. so let's understand what it is. So it's some function of pi. So what a pi, some positive number is sum equal to one. This is a simplex, right, in the Euclidean space. So it's a function in the simplex. 
the fundamental property of this function, known, of course, by Boltzmann, but usually attributed to Shannon, who wrote it in a special case, is that the function is, I always keep forgetting, for convex or concave. I have to, yeah, it's impossible to, to tell who is concave, who is convex. But anyways, doesn't, it's, Gaussian doesn't change sign. So pre presume it's convex, it's just the matter of convention. So on this simplex, this is a function like that, or like that, it's material. And so it's, it's, it's second differential is a quadratic form. So a quadratic form is a metric. So it's a Riemannian manifold. So simplex given a Riemannian metric. So the simplex, kind of simple shape, and now Riemannian metric, which is not it's a flat metric, but something different, Gaussian form. What kind of metric is this? And, and so, what the metric is that? People don't know that. This is, I suppose, must that the children in a, in, a, in, a, in a high school must know, right? Actually, also I didn't know that, and I just asked some people, and then they, the long chain of names came from there. And then going through the internet, I came up to Fisher. Everybody reinventing this metric. About five, six, seven, dead, ten people attached their name to that. I forgot who was the first name given to me, which actually was a mathematical biologist whose name I've forgotten. But I think Fisher was the first, it was something, 20 something. This metric has constant positive sectional curvature. And moreover, it's isometric, up to a constant, to simplex on the sphere. And I saw it is given by the real part of the moment map. And, uh, and this explains very many things about entropy and quantum mechanics. It automatically brings you to quantum mechanics, by the way. If you just start working in this context, quantum mechanics, you go to Hilbert space. Uh, though it's real Hilbert space, but you can complexify it by this change little things, yeah. You go to the phenomenon entropy and quantum mechanical entropy, and this uh, rather, rather amusing things come there. So, this is the instances how biology, if you understand very little point in, in, in biology, it brings you it brings you to interesting mathematics. This is one of the aspects, of course, of learning biology. And by these papers, again, Fisher, Haldane, and Wright are very, very mathematical. And they emphasize that there must be, as usual, traditional uh, selection, evolution by selection, not sufficiently quantitative. Now they do it quantitative. And these things, all the, t all the time said by mathematicians, Haldane, by the way, was not really a mathematician. He was really polymath, he was chemist, he done fundamental contribution to chemistry and to biology and to this kind of mathematics. And, uh, and he, he had very good, I mentioned, he had some great ideas in, in, in genetics and in, 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 in biology in general. And he just emphasized that and still there are lots of people who try to find quantitative approach to evolution. Because, as I, uh, come, come my, some went back to Darwin that was very kind of not precise. And this was the whole issue, is, uh, how fast evolution, how in the way it goes. And now I, I may, uh, there are some work by, um, I forget, by Villiant, I think his name, which is called probably approximately correct, if you know computation a little bit. Computer sciences, he invented some probably approximately co correct pack theory, which is, was meant to make mo more quantitative argument in biology. But if you look at this article, there is nothing biological there, just usual computer science. And it's unclear how it applies or not. So, yeah, yeah, and, <coughs> and so the opposite to how we will proceed. At some moment, I start talking about biology, and here is will be first instance where we have serious mathematical problem, which is related to biology, is protein folding. And so let me say a couple of words about that. So the problem is, so we have this chain of molecules, and you want to understand how they will behave in, in, in solution. And they, they have some kind of interactions. The first mathematical study of that, I believe due to Fleury, and it was somewhere in the 40s, who, by the way, invented also percolation theory. Some people here do percolation theory unaware that it was invented by Fleury and who, un and who unlike proving mathematical theorem, really made some non-trivial prediction in, 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 in chemistry. So, so it justified or, or introduced the excluded volume principle. And this is uh, so didn't use the word percolation. Yeah? And it was not invented by mathematician. It wasn't, he was a chemist. And, he, and one of his work was, great work was 
this, he, he, he imagine all this percolation theory in different contexts. It's called look at how colloids be, become uh, this transition, uh, phase transition colloids. And another, this was, was studying polymers, how polymers behave there. But he was not concerned in folding. He was just concerned how in random, how random chain, what will be the shape of this chain. And he raised this major, major problem, which now called this self-avoiding random walk. And he kind of analyzed it in a non-trivial fashion. But still, major, main problem about this uh, random walk open. Nobody knows. So, of course, if the, you, you allow self-intersections, then the average diameter of a random uh, molecule will be square root, constant square root, the length of the molecule. And he gave another formula. They're saying it will be slightly longer. But nobody knows whether it's true or not. Nobody proved anything close to that. Yes, absolutely, there is no, in my view, non-trivial results about that. Lots of work, very difficult mathematical theorem. But the question was on the same level as was left by Flory. It's amazingly both in dimension two and dimension three. In dimension three, crucial for folding. In, if you think about that, so what makes this folding? And so why it is mathematics, why it is actually biology? And physicists can say nothing about that. Because if you're a physicist, how you approach problem? Okay, you have some interaction, so you write this energy. Which sequence to take? Of course, you take a random sequence and do something. You can may or may not prove something. It's still rather difficult to prove anything because you cannot even evaluate the length of the thing, yeah? But it's absolutely irrelevant because a sequence is in biology. Biology is anti-random. It is not random. And you don't know what is anti-random means. And this is the whole point. And the best for the moment mathematical methods for evaluating, understanding how they fall, they were shaped what would be the shape of this folded stuff is done by artificial intelligence methods. While well, they call it artificial intelligence, it's just a right, trained um, new artificial neural network. And it's not surprising why it is so. It certainly was predictable. It is exactly where our brain is not so good. There are some masses, people having gift, guessing that, but machines do this job much better. And, but we still we don't understand it. It's, it's a, it's, you, you look at very many examples of proteins folding of which you know, train your network, and then it extrapolates it. It just, well, maybe I'll say in some later points how these things work. But, but that's an absolutely fascinating question. And if you go into biology, it's not just, even formulation of it is not so simple. Because you have to know that protein is not just a random sequence. It's a sequence with certain functions, and it has certain history. And there are lots of variations how you have to formulate the problem, which makes, in my view, it's much more interesting. You cannot just isolate it and say something and solve it and be happy, because even that is impossible. But even if you do, if you do it, you will be completely off target. Yeah? It's, it's a, you have to learn much more. You have to learn volumes of what you know about proteins to be understand it. And of course, for example, this scale, yeah, it only works, this, whatever you prove, will be when you have this protein chain with most three, maybe 400 amino acid residues. If it's too long, yeah, it's not an asymptotic statement. Asymptotic will be horrible. Nothing will, will, will work. And nature knows that. Yeah? These long proteins don't fold, and they serve different functions. And this exam, it is a, when we come to the next level, all that is essential for what life is. It's not accidentally like that. Right? In a way, it's not accidentally. Main thing, of course, accidental. But, uh, but uh, uh, now we come to the first. This was pre pre preamble. So, okay, we can make now a little interruption, maybe five minutes, and then we actually this was a kind of a preamble, and then we start with the first lecture. Okay. Here is again Buffon, and who 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 knows who knew mathematics as good as we do. He was, you know, he was translating Newton. So you know, probably reading it, it was not so easy. And he invented this famous experiment with Buffon needle. It was an absolutely beautiful piece of mathematics. He created integral geometry and uh, geometric probability. And then, so, and we can roughly divide problem in two 
kinds, two extreme cases, one on the molecular level, which I mentioned, like protein folding. Protein folding is not it, it related to biology, it's still not biology, it's kind of biochemistry, yeah? Just one molecule, it's not alive yet, yeah? It's just one remarkable molecule. And we shall discuss philosophically what happened there, it's an incredible step, one of the incredible steps in the structure of life. And this was so exciting. And uh, in, in well, at some moment I will give a mathematical example. And second, it's opposite. What happens with the whole earth, how animal, plants, and human bacteria coexist here, how they interact. And then there is something in between. And, and then there, there are indeed kind of relation between that. For example, there's a moment, if you, what I, maybe right. Something like this. And then there is this number. So, so what is the relation? For example, if this number it would be at most that you add a little bit and then so what are these numbers? You see? The whole world depends on this. This billion are all the number of people on Earth. Eight, eight billion. But imagine this, because this is slightly below a thousand. If it was slightly above a thousand, it would be impossible. We depend on that. Very, very, very serious. Again, this would be then my lectures. So this molecule, not even molecular biology, just elementary chemistry related to our biology. N is a nitrogen. And this is an essential part of our body. Yeah? We have about, in your body, I forgot how many of nitrogen. I forgot, 50 grams of, a, of, of, of five kilograms or something, I forgot. Significant amount, not very much, but you have some nitrogen in your body, in your, in your proteins, mostly. Yeah. And, uh, and, and this nitrogen came from where? where the, yeah, from where nitrogen, what put this nitrogen from the air? This is energy in joules per mole, in joules, yeah, it's some units, yeah energy of this connection. Very hard to break these molecules. You have to break them in order to put into your body. And half of them, and so, and this is slightly bigger than when it's being synthesized from, from high, uh, high, ammonia synthesized from hydrogen and, 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 um, and, and nitrogen. And uh, half of that in, in the body of us come, come from some chemical process. And this is, of course, but most people are not aware of that, why they're alive. And they're alive because this Haber, Haber-Bosch process. Everybody here would be not be here if not for that process, because half of the need to take it away from you, you die. Right? Of course, it will not you die, population would collapse at most to this number, or even below, and if it's on random, some of us here die, right? and we don't know that. Yeah? It's a fantastic kind of situation. We live our uh, knowledge of the world when we were by far below the, the, of the Neanderthals who better understood the world we live than we do. It's an incredible situation, by the way. Yeah? And mathematicians are as bad as anybody else. We don't know what, what feeds us, what supports us, and what this support is about to disappear in about 50, 60 years. Because we don't even don't aware of that. For example, that you know, this is a major fact of existence of, of of the Earth as we know it today. But we shall come in the last lecture. So there will be three lectures. Yeah. So I will return to that. And so there will be the following. First is just what is life. First was a, what say was in preamble. Now what about life and about this? I explain different perspective what we are. And secondly, it will be genetic molecular bioengineering. So what happens today and what changes the world? And this is fantastically interesting things happening. And they kind of new new things happens every maybe couple of years. 
And then perspective, what will be in, in 60 years. And then it's questionable. It depends on what we shall do. And what we shall do depends on our knowledge. And if you know as little as we know now, as humanity, it is the end of that. It will be the end of the century. There will be no civilization, absolutely. No chance. If we continue the way we do, there is absolutely no chance. It will be, be close to, exponential goes to the end. And as happens already, you see some little places like Haiti, or the same happened in this, uh, in Africa, there was this, where there was a horrible genocide. It is for the same reason. Yeah, there was no around enough food, but people were killing in millions. And if it continues, people start killing and eating each other in billions. If we don't make right decisions, and to make right decisions, we have to know what we are, and we don't. And this is very scary. Okay, but but uh, but not, uh, the major problem is uh, as mathematicians we can forget about that and enjoy biology and uh, intellectual uh, intellectual uh, something happening wrong here. So ah, uh, so so there are others. one, there is two, and there is something in between, and where the most kind of tricky thing is embryology, and it was already said by Morgan at some moment, who didn't care for molecular biology, he just only worked in genetics, and there actually were also quite remarkable mathematical ideas, if I have time to explain, especially some idea of Surtivan, who suggests completely new kind of geometry, which we don't have, yeah, if you pro properly develop it. But we will be still sticking to molecular biology, and so we want to understand what it is. Ah, one second, I, I missed. Something that sometimes go, sometimes not. Ah, I have to do probably like that. Yeah, it's more. Yeah, so this Buffon who is, he, he emphasizes this point that we don't understand the living, living matter. And why I say it's very important statement. Because in order to understand something, you start from non-understanding. If you already look, you understand anything, you're just so idiot. You understand nothing. You start understanding, you realize you understand so little. And then the famous Socrates statement, I know, I don't show, no, I, I know nothing, is he thought a lot and realized this and this and this, he doesn't know. But I mean, he can say what you don't know, right? And this is a understanding what you know and what you don't know. And Buffon, who was a mathematician, partly, partly for new physics, he understood from mathematical or physical point of view, life is impossible. And so, you know, as a mathematician, you must accept, life is impossible. If you think otherwise, you never thought about that, right? Because it's, <laughs> you cannot make even in your mind a reasonable model of that. And, and, but, and then you want to do it. Once you understood, then you, have, you can start moving ahead, right? S -s 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 even before you can start to formulate reasonable questions, even before that, you have to realize there is something to ask. So this is a general thing, which I said, and I wrote, and then, and then we come to the next point. What is life? So this was definition suggested by, by Carl Sagan, who was a astrophysicist, astronomer, and was used by, by, by Gaffa, and this is a, well, I think, in my view, well, I, I don't want to be critical, yeah, but I don't think it's adequate definition. And so, so in one of the point, what I will be saying, that the whole idea, and it's not exactly it's only my idea, but shared by other people of a certain point, the whole idea to give definition of life is, put it mildly, not correct idea. And why? So I shall explain it. But what we can do, at least look what looks like life. And then immediately it must be understood because what we see is not what is there. This is a classical example. You see this triangle there, there is no triangles, as you know. So our brain, both our mind eye, as much as our eye, didn't see what you see, what's before your eyes. It sees what's already in your head. 90% is what you had. And then he reconstructs on the basis of what he was seen before. And this is a very good way to think. And, uh, and this is a kind of, again, a principle of if you make, to, if you, when you, to, people try to make, and this is a very interesting problem, which is part of what I say in a way, 
making artificial intelligence, this might be taken into account. You are not supposed to do straightforwardly. You have to learn from biology, right? It's not works so straightforwardly. But still, look at that. Just in this picture. Where is life, where is non-life? So, so I recognize this, of course, as a life. I don't know why, but you know it's life. Even if you were in a different world and saw these patterns, kind of, you see it's life. Now, what is that on this right hand side? Yeah, I see. Mathematicians. Yeah. So we have to chew everything, yeah? Uh. This, you know. Yeah. It's E, it is, it's number E, but you start from the from one. And by the way, so how, how you can remember that? One, eight, this rather amusing thing for, 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 for myself. So what about this number? You don't suppose to know this number, yeah? It's the date, the date of birth of Leo Tolstoy. <laughs> and uh, so in somebody rose away, so could never remember number pi, but then he realized that I was two, twice repeated this number. Uh, and I must say, I never remembered, of course, when the Leo Tolstoy was born. But when you know these two things, you remember both of them. Because now it's interesting. I don't remember any kind of nonsense who, 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 how many digits are number e, and I say pi in e, or how many, when it was born, this or not person, but when together, it's worth remembering. So, if you see this number, yeah, you bet on the next planet you see something like that. You can't have it without life around. That this, this is, I think, unquestionable, right? There is no known physical process which can produce this number. And this, you can chase like this symbol, but here about 120 symbols, 10 symbols, 120 things, and so it's kind of long, so it can be accidental arrangements. But you see, this depends on your perception as living creature. So one living creature, look at that and realize there is another living creature, intellectual, intell intelligence minor issue. Yeah? It will be, this is a minor point. So life is there, but here there is no life, it's Mars. So it's dead, and you see it's dead. And so the point is that life, kind of, kind of random, but random in a very different way. And one of the point, which I want to say, to develop mathematical perception of mathematics, you have to develop new probability theory. You have to understand that physical way of thinking about probability is not appropriate in biology. Up to some extent appropriate, and many things of course work, and, but not all. And here is the example. Next example. Now, what can you say about that? What, what is life, what is not life? You see, here is zebra. Here is a brain. This, of course, you see is life. This just cannot be accidental. It's hard to say why, but it can be. If you find such and there, you come to a plane and see this kind of pattern, it again it has too much structure mixed with randomness. And this is the human brain, folding of the human brain. However, all these three, of course, they're not life. I mean, it accidentally happens to a brain. Accidentally, there's some pattern. And they're actually a solution of the same equation. And there's nothing especially biological about that. And people, on the other hand, there's a lot of mathematicians, biologists, exploiting that. It's called Turing diffusion uh, reaction equation, equation reaction, I remember how it's called. This is the equation. Well, mathematicians take the T derivative, and then you have Laplacian and ordinary some vector field, some ordinary differential equation. So you have ordinary differential equation plus diffusion term. And then in mathematics, there are lots of different forms where you have Laplacian or which kind of vector fields you have. But in kind of this situation, your space is Euclidean space, Laplacian, ordinary Laplacian, and this R, this vector field corresponds to exactly to mass, mass this kinetic equation, mass action equation. This is a kind of polynomial of certain kind, and a very special kind of chemical reactions go there. And then choosing particular R, 
you may have various patterns of this type. And there are quite a whole breed of mathematical biologists writing this equation and see what happens, ta 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 ta. It's not biology. It happens to you, we are also physical, right? So you move and you fall like, like a stone. It doesn't make it to you, 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 the falling of people from airplanes is no more biological than throwing stones. Not exactly, people can you know, move like that, but it's a minor issue. So, so this is not, this is not, but this, for example, this is more biological. Why the hell is that? Right? And this is biology. And understanding that and formulating that mathematically, why the presence of, of such sequence make a general statement which would be applicable to that. So if you want to define life and pattern of life, you must include that. And that's very difficult. We don't have a chance to do it. And of course, about Darwinian evolution, what, what was said is rather, rather funny. So if you find that, by NASA say, no, no, it's not life, forget it. <laughs> right, of course, they are usually, if you look at the discussion of these people, you can participate with them, though you know nothing about biology. And this is not serious discussion. But there are some more serious ones in a second we come to that. By the way, what about that? Uh, that's another more interesting pattern, yeah? Hmm? You probably know what it is, yeah? This is actually electron, this cream electron micrograph of a part of the cell, yeah. Namely the plastic rexilum, how pronounced correctly, I don't know. And the, pl and the plasmic reticulum. And this is actually a very interesting structure inside of your cell, yeah? So there is a schematic picture and how it looks. It's really remarkable kind of picture of a membrane folded and a very tricky folded membrane. And I don't know if there was, there was serious mathematics, mathematical study, study of that. Because yeah, this is a, one essential part of your cell where the pro 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 proteins are being synthesized and uh, occupies much part of your cell. And there are much of that, which just just pictures. But this, of course, still doesn't look, uh, although it's truly biological stuff, you ha it's not specifically biological. It's just about membranes. And, uh, and this is interesting, but it's not mathematics. It's mathematically, but it's not biologically. And here is the point which I have to make, I will make little history of applying mathematics, but bi biology, at least from a certain point of view, and this is from point point of view of mathematicians, start from microscope from microscopes, from male it's it's a cellular molecular biology, and usually what you see outside, it, you can organize mathematically, but this kind of a, have nothing to do with this biology. I guess you have. Organism interacting in a relatively simple, written, not simple way, but described, effectively described way, correctly or incorrectly, and then you do, do mathematics here. But interesting, but mathematically interesting structure, which is not kind of yes, applying physical style mathematics, start appearing on the molecular level. And molecular level started with, with microscopy. In microscopy, as we know today, started with the work by Levin Hook. No, but now you become to, to how biology understand, understand uh, biology. And, um, and so the, the main point of modern biology that uh, uh, dislike diversity which we see of animal and plants, on the molecular level there is some unity of the structure and this kind of, kind of and this universality of the structure. And this from from mathematical point of view is exactly interesting. So that there is not as elementary as you have in physics when there is one set of equations, but there are few basic principles and they are being the same for all organisms. Organisms starting from bacteria on and up to some point even in viruses. And then as Monod said, if you know bacterium, most common Shirisha coli bacterium, you know anything about elephants, which is not quite true, right? But still it's close to the truth. So it's tremendous universality. And so and this one of the points in, in life. That life on the basic level, life understood as a life on the, of a cell. We can forget about 
big organism, they have minor variations, and these are cells. And cells run by, by molecules, they filled by molecules, active, active molecules. And this what is life in genetic terms, but now it might be specialized, and so what people say, I don't want to. So it divided in so there are these, these points, which are here. Oh. So this is this matter, energy, and, and, and information, and, and matter and energy related to metabolism. Of, of homeostasis, energetic balance of the cells, and then there is reproduction. And reproduction related to information. And information appears in two parts. First, information being translated to your progeny, and secondly, information translated from the source of information to building this instruction, how to build the organism, cell in particular. And then there is next level, how we make multicellular organism. This is another story, which is, we don't touch upon but, but the, what we have before our eyes is these three aspects of that, and in different people look at this very differently. It's amusingly people, genetists, who work in evolution, they emphasize, of course, the production and transport in, in flows of information. But if people work in biochemistry, especially biophysicists, they would speak first about energy balance and how energy being produced it is distributed in your in your organism, particularly your cells. And both are rather complicated, but still logically and mathematically more attractive is information. And this because it's more specific for, for life. And all these chemical processes, <coughs> well, they are less mysterious, though they are how, the, how, how they appeared. But they were first they were tremendously complicated, on the other hand. But I think I'm missing some pages. Yeah. So this we have to eliminate. So, so here is the major things inside of the cell. We define the, the work of the, the aspect related to information, right? This, this is what related to information. You see, in a second they say what it is, if you don't know. But then there is, oh. then there are the cells, schematic picture of the cell. This more realistic picture of bacteria, this, uh, this is prokaryotic, this eukaryotic cells, they're different sizes, different colors, I'm joking because there is no color. And this is a, a actual micrograph of, of the animal cell. Just to have these pictures, but I want to show you something else in a second, and then come back. I hope it is not lost. The guess with Leon Gook. Yeah, here it is. Here is a metabolic, ah, one second. Something happened which I don't like. So it disappeared. It was there, already it disappeared. I have some problem. A second ago it was here and then it disappeared. Something funny. Ah, you see what's happening. Huh? I don't listen. Probably the same happens to living room. Somewhere here. Here is a metabolic network. It's, uh, there are hundreds of chemical reactions going in your, in your cell, in your body, and the most important one is energy, the one which creates energy, uses, uh, there are two mechanisms, two chemical processes, and one of them is breathing using oxygen. And, uh, and uh, there is a kind of, which, which actually by physical process, which creates some potential, electric potential membrane of your cell in this tremendous mass, yeah, I mean just. And I don't know who knows that, who, who, except for people who work on that, knows what they, what, what you say about that? Is there anybody who knows that really, yeah? Metabolic, it's impossible, huge amount of knowledge. You may, you may make sure each circle there is roughly a Nobel Prize. And Nobel Prize is a work of a big group of people, and very, very smart people. Yeah? So, this, this Nobel Prize is in biochemistry and molecular both the, the serious prizes. They don't give them for, for, some, for some nonsense. Well, there are exceptions, by the way. Some of them were given, not maybe here, but 
accidentally. But most of them, and, and uh, so, but this is to show you it is a mess. And this we don't touch. It. And in a way, you can leave without exactly knowing it. Right? You don't have to know exactly what happens with your digestion, you know, to do mathematics, you just eat. Right, and this is a, how we take this. Because I, I, well, I know actually I was nothing about that, even about the most basic things. But just, I know it's justifiably, justifiable not to know it, because it's complicated. On the other hand, this is a little bit of a structure of a cell, very schematic, but the, the, the basic points, ah, look, 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 also something disappeared. Something happening f funny in here. Ah, well, we haven't come to this. Don't quite understand how things are appear and disappear on the screen. <laughs> because pictures are the main... Yeah, maybe look at this, because this is also concerning patterns of life, before you go on understanding what is life. So none of them, all of them coming from life. And... Uh, and, and I think if you look at each of them, meet any one of them, you will see, see that. Even, for example, for that one. So if you make this molecule as, as a sequence, and, uh, and it's a rather simple sequence, and still the way there are these <coughs> bonds and they, I don't want to explain what they are. It's insulin, by the way. Insulin is a hormone which we all need, and if you suffer, have diabetes, and diabetes is a rather common disease there are, I think. Uh, about two people in, for, for, for per thousand yeah, suffering diabetes, one. And uh, so the one the remarkable progress is recently due to molecular engineering was uh, artificial bacteria, bacteria, bacteria made insulin. And when people started this genetic manipulations, they were very much concerned that something wrong may happen and trying to put some limits in some rules how not to overdo that. However, smart people just either for fame or for money has done it and then there were rules and now this insulin came up and, and lots of people were saved. Yeah? Experience shows that usually all serious inventions in science, they may be dangerous, but people, they save life rather than, and on the contrary, all this action against it very destructive. You know how many people, say, in Germany died because of the movement against atomic power? Yeah? The estimate about two million. Yeah, as I say, all action about nuclear power, just hundreds of thousands of people die because nuclear power goes down, because it replaced, of course, by burning. The stuff which is about one million times, one million times more dangerous than atomic power. One million times more dangerous. Not two times, not three times, but million times. Because people die, 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 develop all kinds of diseases on all levels from burning, say in Paris here, yeah, it's here in Bure slightly better. The number of people dying from not using nuclear power goes in 10,000 every year or 20,000. It's an interesting, there are people who kind of fall. Humanity usually exactly those who are more extremely, extremely dangerous because they're ignorant. Partly, but not, but partly because they know their purpose is just to fight, not to do something better. And this is another very interesting square is Voynich. And here is, if you look at this page, do you think it is come from life, it was there? And the, this is the whole book written like that, and nobody knows what is there. It's called F Voynich Manuscript. It's about three or four hundred pages book, was discovered, discovered, found rather recently, well, a hundred years ago. And nobody knows what's written there, if it's language or it's a joke or what. And uh, so when you say pattern of life and non-life, here it is whether it's actually language or it's a kind of a joke. And we cannot decide. And then even in this simple example, it indicates how we can say what is life when you can solve this problem. And this is, of course, the same nation, the problem. How random and how structural it is. So life is something both having structurally organized randomness. and we don't know exactly the level of the structure. And of course, for languages, which is much easier because there are many languages, we study them, they're much more open, we still don't know. 
So how we can say what is life? Yeah, having only one example at our, at our hands. And also even this kind of pattern which I uh, made myself, you see there cannot happen accidentally. So very much life is something which is not that. Ah, here is, I, I, I broke, here is by the way this living book. Okay, so now you see it. It just was divided, but the, the pictures just in, uh, were immersed in a completely uh, wrong way. And when I was making these pictures, yeah. And then about these days, which were big events was happening, and one which I want to emphasize was Haber Bohr process, which is, I think, exactly the date is known as one. Oh. And the specific moment was known when Haber was demonstrating his process of synthesizing ammonia out of, out of nitrogen and hydrogen. And the essential part when you have, when you burn, when you, uh, hydrogen and nitrogen, they make, uh, uh, ammonia and, and number of energy is separated slightly more than that. The, the one which connect to, say, roughly, say, 1,000, which is slightly not quite right, yeah? So here, and, and it's about, about 1,000, but if you burn H2, so you need, and right, you have this N2, uh, H2 and N2. Then it goes two times N H3, right? Correct. And so if you look at the energy here, of this connection and burning, you, you have slightly more than that. But of course you lose in the entropy because you have two. You slightly lose in, lose in the entropy. And uh, because here there are more molecules than here, and so the only way to make this process work, you need rather, you need strong volume. You have to bring them together so to lower the entropy of the, of the implements. And this was achieved by Haber, and the Bosch who was present there, who was an industrialist, who engineer, realized you can do it industrially. You can make sufficiently high, high pressure. And this is a moment, sooner thereafter it was become process, and if you look at the curve of human population, this is exactly more or less where it started going exponentially up. So the major factor, the major event which happened in the human history after we separated from chimpanzee about six million years ago is that. If you don't quite realize it. Ecologically speaking, well, first hum 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 humanoid appeared, then it's like we modified and became Homo sapiens in about six million years. Then there was brief preparation, and then this happened. And this is what we believe it's called Anthropocene. Now, life on Earth is dominated by human. We, we over outweigh all animals, animals meaning, I'm sorry, all animals like ourselves, yeah? And uh, not, 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 not uh, insects, yeah? And, uh, and certainly our stock even, even more, and we, kind of, we use almost all resources food-wise which is possible in us, maybe close to one half, maybe two-thirds, so we are on the verge of completely using that, exactly because here this energy here is slightly more than 100, because it's two times, yeah, so it's more. So, so the major was problem to, to this H2 was not so hard to divide. It's not, but major kind of problem is in that. And then it, it, so before, of course, before that, this nitrogen was connected in, in, in the, by, by, by some kind of bacteria living on particular, on particular plants, yeah? And, uh, and that you know, couldn't produce as, as much as that. And then there is this in, in my last lecture, I explained what is the problem related to that. It's all fine. So I have so many people, we can feed them. 
but this will not last for long for some, some principle. Yeah, it was temporal solution, beating kind of, you beaten Malthus. So Malthus was beaten by this difference between two energies, and suddenly it postponed this effect, of Malthus, Malthusian effect, by about 100 or 200 years. But you see, with Malthus, is, 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 when you speak about Malthusian, people who are against Malthus, if you start talking to them, they're against, they have an argument insulting you. Yeah? So if you say, aha, exponential goes so fast, and whatever you do, it grows, they become very excited and just insult you with all bad words, so I don't want to repeat them. It's, it's an interesting, interesting point, psychological points. And then it, 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 another important event which happened, and then historically very amusing, was Becquerel, and this is just accidentally looking at this, I was looking at what are the key moments in history, but Becquerel discovered radioactivity. And this, of course, was a big event. And then, let's make some qu quotation here, I hope it will be visual. Yeah, exactly what many things were hidden, yeah. So what you can learn from biology, it's what kind of fun you may have. And there is a collection of books I suggest reading. And now we come to these patterns. Uh, now everything, everything goes in the right order. Yeah. And so indeed, the quotation of Pasteur that if you don't know what is bacteria, and if, then you know nothing. And without bacteria, life is impossible. And the essence of life is bacteria. And sometimes you can say it's anthropocene, but of course not. It's always was and probably always will be the world of, of bacteria. They are dominant life. And forever will be dominant life, and we are long gone. That's so should be noticed, and then you see everything, all this history. Yeah, and this great man like Hooke, who discovered cells, and who was very much mistreated by Newton, and, uh, and then kind of the last thing which happens, in, in recently was discovery of CRISPR. It was fantastic thing, machinery, bacteria used for the for the immunity, Im uh, like our immune system, and uh, I will talk about this more in a uh, certain level, but now I wanted to discuss important events. Yeah, so what are the turning points in the human history? So this, to the second we return to that. Yeah, this is an amusing thing about Becquerel. So Becker, uh, uh, according to story he once, according to his, his diary, he just came home after vacation and there was some piece of a uranium which was not exposed to light and he still there was an effect on the photographic plate. And so in this way he discovered it. Radioactivity is very similar how Fleming discovered penicillin. However, somebody said that all histories are just lies people agreed upon. Who said that? We don't know who said it, but it attributed to Napoleon Bonaparte. And I don't know whether he, he probably had never said it, but this will look the history of science it's exactly like that. So now see, if you look slightly carefully, if you, of course, if you look this more carefully, you see something funny. Because what was the name of the Becquerel who discovered radioactivity? He was Henri Becquerel, right? And this was a kind of major discovery, of course, in science, which determines our life. Because, you see, I point them as things which changed radically our life. For example, with this Harper-Bosch process, little ha would have changed because people were working on that. It was really a technical achievement. If he didn't do it, haven't done it, it was done by somebody else in a matter of years. But there were less kind of obvious things which were done and could have been done earlier. And, and the discovery of, of um, both of penicillin and with the activity could be different. And so you see, here is what he the, the written in the back, this person who discovered it in his, in his diary or whatever. And, but the name, he says, Admon Becquerel, yeah? Can you read it? Can you explain it? Isn't it funny? Can we explain that? 
You, read, you can read French, yeah, well, how? Uh, this Henri Becquerel discovered, and uh, received Nobel Prize about 10 years afterwards, for, together with Marie Curie, for discovery artificial, uh, of, of, of radioactivity, of uh, radioactivity of uranium. And, and this is what was written there. So in, in the idea was, even when there is no light, it was not exposed to light, it still was exposing some rays. Can you explain it? What do you think? Well, why is a different name? Hmm? No idea? I mean, history of science is very tricky. If you look at the Wikipedia and say history of science, they always say what is written in textbooks. And some people in mathematics will say this Poincare theorem, it means Poincare proof theorem or something like that. Absolutely none. In history, you see how to say it. Mathematicians and scientists they say, oh, well, it doesn't, who cares? However, the way I, I feel it, you cannot say and be, believe into the wrong things, whether it's history or something. If you say something, you're supposed to know what you say. And so, and actually, I remember when there was some year of physics, and some great physicist, actually, who received rather recently Nobel Prize, was emphasizing that physicists should know their history. They have to remember that Brownian motion was discovered by Brown, which was not. Brown was a good biologist. He discovered, I think, nucleus or nucleolus. But what exactly he discovered in the cell, some part of the cell, he never discovered Brownian motion. He studied Brownian motion. He was not the first, not the last. The people before him, this Yangen House, who was a great scientist, he discovered it and gave better explanation than Brown. And Brown knew about his work. And he, the only Brown proved it, that it was not, not moved by angels. This was some people conjectured, and they believed because. It was pollen, so it was alive because it moved. It must, he realized it doesn't depend on that. But this is, is Becquerel, is, is, is Brown, the one story. But this is another story with Becquerel. So, Edmund Becquerel was the father of Henry Becquerel. And this is written by the person called Claude Felix Abelipe. How would you pronounce it? Here is the name, you see it, yeah? and, he, and this was done in 40 years before, in 1861. And he quotes the father of Henri Becker, for some reason, who was a, 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 a specialist in optics, because he discovered that phenomenon. And Becquerel has little to do with that. I mean, he studied this, he neither discovered it nor gave correct explanation. Correct explanation with Becquerel exp uh, experiments was done by Marie Curie Rosenford, but not by Becquerel. And according to what I read, to the article, the, analyzing that, Becquerel just was very active and he promoted himself and the Nobel Committee was not aware of the story. But if you look at the, what he, Becquerel wrote, first he discovered it 40 years after, and secondly, he didn't give better explanation. He understood less than this guy. Though in, in, in many other conclusions he made, were incorrect. Because he was a serious scientist, but he was not a discoverer of, of, of radioactivity. In no way discovered, depending how he defined connection with discovery, he was one of the people involved into that. And it, but there were other people, by the way, making this observation uh, and before, but he, neither he made correct explanation. And so this tricky, tricky story. So, history is, history of science is quite amusing. Because, you see, just was so, when I think about, say, it, through discoveries, people who made discovery, like, like Mendel, you can imagine, or, or more, something even more, more pronounced when people discovering, like, atoms or, or, or something in molecular biology, how excited that should become. I mean, you really, uh, you see something which you, in there, and nobody saw before. And this is interesting to imagine this, because if you look at that, you can imagine how re remarkable it is. It gives you a way to feel greatness of those discoveries. And in, for example, with, with radio radioactive material, you do it and then you realize it is, it makes this race regardless of the light, completely impossible new things. And this didn't happen to Becquerel. He was not that level, I understand. He was, he was just a serious scientist, but not that level to realize something impossible happens. Accept it and start doing from that, right? And, and then it is, 
because people who make the discovery think they either they were before that or but after that they actually become move to a different psychological level making that oh. and then another phenomenon actually with Fleming I, I'm quoting something else because there was somebody Ernst Duchamp whatever who discovered similar effect in 1896 and there was an article explaining what he's done and he was done very close to what Fleming done but he was not really much interested in that and he was not he was a, some working in the lab of Roux. He was Ernst Roux, famous biologist, was, was some student of Pasteur in, in the Pasteur Institute. And uh, he p p perceived different uh, function. He, he didn't discover penicillin. P definitely he's, he worked with some antibiotic, which could not be penicillin. Because, you know, interesting thing about penicillin, when he was discovered accidentally, Fleming never tried it on on, on guinea pig, because penicillin is deadly for guinea pig, for interesting reason, because it destroys the flora, bacterial flora in the intestine completely, and they die. And, and it's okay with rabbits and mice, but the, the, the Duchamp made experiments with guinea pig and they survived. And he treated some people also with some extract from there. And one of the major role of Fleming, of course, he, he was not the first and neither the last discovered this effect of penicillium, but he realized clearly there is some comp chemical component there, and he couldn't, he tried to extract it, but he failed, but he kept that in his lab, and about 20 years later, Fleury, who decided to study the subject matter, studied the literature, found that Fleming had this experiment, asked Fleming to give him that, and he created modern penicillin. Uh, and this was not just in, in two years, yeah, it was very big activity and he really created the whole new technology, new style to making science. He organized several scientists, uh, some of them biochemists, and, and, and they done it. It was fantastic, fantastic achievement and run by Flory. Who, in other Flory, not the same, the same name, not the same who, who discovered percolation. Not discovered, but had identified it. it was just discovered the phenomenon was kind of known, of course, but not identified. And then another interesting story. So, so, so you, always you can imagine what would happen if this, what was done in, in, in 30, or 40, so 30 years later, the earlier would take, would take growth and the penicillin would be discovered 10 years earlier. And we will be living in a completely different world. Of course, it's incomparable to the number of people saved by, uh, created by this process of Haber-Bohr, but still certainly hundreds of millions. Many of us would be not here if not for penicillin. Yeah? Either we or our parents or our grandparents would die in some surgery, trauma, war, whatever. We were, were dependent on that. But if it were discovered some, some time earlier, the world would go into a completely different route. It's completely kind of clear. It would change, could move development of chemistry by five years, give it a push, and so everything would change. And it's hard to say what would happen. And there is another instance of a similar, again, thing which didn't happen. And this was due to Newton. Newton was a great scientist, but very obnoxious person. Not just obnoxious, but he, probably his negative contribution to science was negative rather than positive. For example, he completely stopped development of mathematics in England for hundreds of years. Because he didn't like Leibniz, he didn't like his notation, so he just didn't allow that. And so, England was 100 years before, be behind, behind uh, Europe in development of calculus. But what even worse, he blocked, there was a very fantastic person there, and this name was Gray. Yeah? Stephen Gray. And this was a man similar by Caraby, by his biography to Faraday. He had no education, but he started making experiments in electricity, and he was about 50 years, of, 100 years ahead of his time. And the, he was supported by some astro astronomer, I forgot his name is written here, this is a known story, and Flamsteed, yeah. But Newton, when he learned about that, he made everything to stop it. And the same he done as to uh, preventing also of, of other people, he just, if he see any competition, any good idea from somebody, he try to stamp them out. It was very bad, for, again, which may be not true, yeah, 
this is what you take from, from, from books. And maybe it was not exactly like that, yeah, but it agrees from many sources, yeah. He was very, very unpleasant person, and there were some personal reason he was certainly a very unhappy man for some reason. And this, again, if, if electricity would develop, say, 20 or 30 years earlier, it also would be, in England, say, imagine it would develop this industry. It would be a very different world, yeah. As we know, many things was happening on the verge of kind of, could move this way or that way. Now we're seeing something else in politics happening. So what's happening with the war in Ukraine and just uh, the, the way things not, not happening and they could have happened and will happen, we don't know. And they're kind of accidental up to a large extent. And uh, this not directly related to some scientific discoveries, but they may in some moment change. So what happens in a unpredictable direction. Combination, usually a combination of political and scientific phenomena. Because this, by the way, this way Haber, he also, after that, he also produced this gases, chemical weapons, which were used in the first, in the first World War. And so, which is, was less significant, because all the number of people killed during the wars was negligible, yeah, in this exponential picture, there was tens of millions of just peanuts. Even, even the, 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 the people who tried the best for the sake of humanity, killing people in hundreds of millions, like communism, China, they couldn't beat how much was saved by, by penicillin. And by the way, both Fleming and Flory insisted that they were not doing it for the sake of humanity, just for fun. This must be realized, yeah. People who do something for the sake of humanity usually kill people. Yes, it's the only way to make people happy. So they will disappear. Okay, so it is a, we stop here. This is our first lecture. In the second, the way I, I project it, I continue this. So I have to put it on the net, I clean it a little bit to be sure it's correct. So we can see what happens afterwards. But the history of science is extremely kind of mm, the only way you can pre imagine what can happen. Look in the history, though history never repeats itself. Yeah, and just people, people invented things for different reasons. But the, all, all, all it tells you that thing may happen, an interesting thing may happen, and so you may encourage you to do something unusual. Yeah, this is a, the point of looking at the history. It is certainly quite exciting. Now. In the moment, this CRISPR, yeah, and related things, uh, I think is most exciting. This, uh, which we will be talking in the th third lecture. So yeah, I, I, I explain some elementary, basic, not elementary, but kind of basic facts about molecular biology, so we can speak about what comes. And then I, I'll talk about this genetic engineering. There was a big progress recently, and I explain so what was happening, so like CRISPR or phage assisted continuous evolution or something we all in, in interact now this new kind of vaccine which you have you know there was remarkable progress with vaccines they developed this new rna mrna vaccines which is a process it's quite remarkable how, how it happened yeah so now we can make vaccine for almost any, anything at least for, for viral infections, maybe for bacterial infections, it will not work so well, right? In, in a matter of weeks, yeah, you can make a vaccine in two weeks rather than in two, in, a, in a six or three months as was before. It can do everything chemically. And what was the point? And so, so how it happened? This again, very interesting, not only scientifically, but also kind of, um, kind of economically, because the idea is that you have to in, in, insert mRNA into your cells, in, in, into your immune cells, and they don't want to go there. There was this idea a long time ago, and actually the people who were coming with this idea actually had problems with their employment because everybody, people believed that what they were doing was nonsense. And, and this would probably would never develop, at least not for this infection we have of COVID. And then the COVID come, and then it became kind of interesting to do it, but there was some obstacle because in order to make this insertion, which I repeat it again, if you've never heard of that, this thing, strangely enough, it takes some time to absorb. 
they don't, your cell don't want to take inside of RNA, and, and we put RNA into your cell, this RNA usually degraded very fast. So we have to put some particular package, you have to cover it by, by something, by some kind of lipids, and so we have to develop this technology, and it look complicated. However, I think it was developed, of course, in the United States, because it's money. And then immediately this company, and in a matter of a year, they developed this production of this, this process. It's a very tricky process. Hard to, but now it's available. You know, it took some time to develop it. And it was power of the free market, I, I would say. Yeah, that's another point. It's incredible how, how, it, how it works. See, in France, they believed they couldn't make it because market was not sufficiently free. Yeah. But in America, they could do that. They tried in England, but they didn't work that well, I think. There was some other problem. But my understanding is that to do things fast, you need people who do, to, to, could do it for money, not for fun, not for your sake, yeah. And that's they save so many lives. And this is a pro, kind of paradoxical situation, like fighting against nuclear energy, or fighting for, 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 for basically kind of so socialistic society, deadly, because it is, things don't develop the way you want to, that it follows some rules and we don't quite know them. So, and this was a, because it, 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 most of experts at some moment estimate this as impossible e economically, because it was very expensive to develop the technology, because it was a big risk to do that, and it was done. I don't know details of that, yeah, but, but that was the major kind of process, progress which happened because of this COVID. And so we have this new technology and it's very good. So some, in some, in future, I think there will be much more, uh, uh, first new vaccines will be discovered, uh, discovered, or may now have discovered them by new vaccines, and some other application of this method, because you now can insert, insert RNA into your cells, develop this technology. And this very powerful technology, and then it will be, see, result will come, will come in a, in a, maybe in, in, a, in the following years along with other things like CRISPR and all this. This CRISPR and that, uh, the third one, this phage, assisted evolution. It's another remarkable thing, progress done in, in biotechnology. And so, and I think the most interesting productive way would be for mathematicians to participate in that. And I think you can do something, but not just sitting like that, but you have to go years learning and sort of thinking and just like for, so solving, uh, realizing what the problem are and trying to solve it cooperating in, or developing idea, but working on that. And I think it's very interesting mathematically and gratifying because we can do something great. And on, because the future, there are this negative part of the future, which because the world, ecology may decay and is decaying, and this is kind of very unhappy, very unhappy about that, and what people do, which, as if to save the ecology destroys it. You know, for example, beer fuel, yeah? It's horribly destructive, yeah? How, who invented this horrible idea? This is one of the most destructive things for ecology or fighting against nuclear power. This exactly destroying ecology and destroying our, our, our life along. On the other hand, there are this new technology coming, like genetic engineering and all form, and that certainly will make things better. But again, there are people who fight against it just for, for not at all on the pretext of doing good things, and, and they're not motivated by that. And, uh, and so, but this is a part which we can, at least myself, but younger people can participate and do something interesting, and probably compensate for destruction which is caused by just excess of our consumption and uh, of too many people. But then, still ecology should be understood. And then again, it's extremely interesting story which is not covered by all this classical population genetics because it depends on much deeper knowledge how things are connected in, in, in biology. For example, one thing which I learned recently from my friends, that if, so you already know there are, for example, problems with bees, yeah? The bees dying because, partly because there are some chemicals uh, and, and intersexes spraying over, and if there is no bees or some other kind of insects, there will be no food. Right? If you th throw away all people from the earth, then little happens, but if you have no bees or no bumblebees or whatever, the amount of production of food goes down by 20 30 percent, which means 20 or 30 percent of this 8 million billion people will die. And they will not die quietly, it will be a horrible thing, and horrible things will happen. And there is another kind of thing which may happen. 
that some of our chemicals may destroy yeast. And if you destroy yeast in the nature, or not partly at least, then it also will have similar effect. Because it was discovered recently that much of the pollination by insects or by plants done because of the yeast. Because yeast give particular flavor and produce pheromones which attracts, which attracts insects. In the same way as this, the same products attracts people eating cheese. Yeah? Tastes of cheese are smells produced by yeast. And the same happens to insects. And so this, if you destroy this chain and you don't know how stable it is, boom, there will be no pollination and a tremendous drop, of course, in, in, in the vegetation and in, in, in our food. And this you have to know. And we kind of live in that, we are supposed to know that. If you're a mathematician, no matter we all eat. And if you don't know from where, where food comes from, it's rather idiotic. You have to understand where it comes. And, uh, and this is one with the motivation to, to, to talking about that. And then there is a book, it's, I forgot the name of the author. It is a physics which is every future president should know. So, president, no, nothing about physics, it's just every layman who has any responsibility I must know. And when I look at that, I must say that many things I didn't know. I was really pretty ashamed of that. Maybe 30% I didn't know, right? And I think the same applies to a level of biology. Of every mathematician is supposed to know. Not to be an idiot, you're supposed to know basic things about everything which is relevant for our life. We are not presidents, but we should not be stupider than presidents. As you know, Americans, we're not especially bright people. And we don't supposed to be stupider than we expected president. Yeah. Some of them we could have known that. So, uh, so one would kind of, it's kind of, yeah, I'm moralizing, it would be stupid, but I think it's nice to know things and, and, and uh, kind of be responsible for a life of the humanity because it depends on the culture, not only scientific, but part of scientific culture we carry. And we are supposed to know that, right? Because as mathematicians, we are kind of ignorant of many things which happen. And, and they're very, very interesting if you learn them. They're extremely interesting, but you have to go some, over, overcome some barrier, the terminological, learn some basics, and then you start learning very fast. And it's very interesting. So this is my invitation. And so I will try to explain something there. But now it will be better with yeah, this very funny thing was happening with pre previous, previous page. Yeah, it was jumping and losing things. And this history is not very important. Just you, you can see there are interesting phenomena in the history of science. And again, they don't, don't tell you what happens in the future, but it, do, it, do, it tells you that things do happen. Interesting things do happen, and you have to be ready for them. But what they are, of course, Feynman says, we got this discussion saying that different people discover things for different reasons, and you cannot imitate that. It's partly true, it's partly not true. But the only thing, of course, that you have to try. Okay, I can switch it off, right? Yeah, okay. Thank you.